we began talking about the culture of this house and the culture that God is bringing about in us in this house. But I don't know if you noticed how many times in that video it said change. Yeah. So we're like, amen. Wait, change. Okay. Ch change is good. And I love the, the concept of when God brings about change, it's always for a good reason. It's going to bring about a good result. It's going to be life-giving. It's going to alter us for the better. It's going to develop something in us that brings utter joy. That's what change is about in him. And so when God begins to nudge change, it's like, it's, you know, not easy, but always, always, always worth it. So for, for uh, example, in this house, if you're noticing, I noticed the balcony is super full this morning. Thank you guys for being here. But you know, some people are probably wondering, why haven't we opened the back curtain yet? Like we're back to normal, um, normal times. And so people are back from holidays and why haven't we opened the back curtain yet? Change. Um, because here's what's going to happen. We have approximately, I believe, 150 seats that we can put up back there. But they need to be there for the new people that God's bringing in. They need to be for, there for the people that are getting saved, that are being transformed. In terms of, we need to open space as we grow, not because we don't like sitting next to each other. Right? And so we're going to decide that we can sit next to each other and we can enjoy each other's company and we actually enjoy being together. Now, once, you know, once we have no more than one seat in between everybody, we'll open the curtain. So a little bit of a challenge, but I heard this story, uh, Craig Rochelle talks about uh, in his church, he was a, a pastor of a, a relatively small church, but he inherited a church and it had its own culture and whatever. And there had been some people there for a long time. And so uh, he had been working on the young people in, this, in the community and trying to draw them into the church. And it had been a long time since there had been new young people in the church. And finally, finally one Sunday, there were four of them. Four young guys come into the church and they sit like right, you know, close to the front, sit down and he's like yes finally all the work has paid off and then this little old lady comes in i think her name was mabel something and she comes in and she stands next to them and she's like sonny this is my seat and he said he was so mad because you know here he'd been working on these young kids come to come to church and she was so focused on i always sit there that she couldn't see the fact that young people were in the church and so he prayed about it and he's like god Right now, I'm just annoyed. Like, how do I handle this? I want to respect her, but how do I handle this? And God gave him a strategy, and he, he called her in, and he just said, you know, I, I, I know you've got kids and grandkids. How, how many grandkids do you have? And she began telling them, and she, he's like, how are they doing? She's like, well, not so good. I've got one in particular. He's so, you know, walking so far from God. I'm just praying for him every day. I'm praying that God will get his heart. And, and Pastor Craig just said, so what would happen if he actually came to church? Like what, what, you know, I, I, you're praying if somebody actually could connect with him and get him into the church, how would you, how would you hope he was received? And he said, the lights just went on. And she was like, oh, this is the, these four boys that I asked to move are somebody else's grandson, somebody else's son, somebody else's kid who somebody prayed to come and here the first thing they felt was unwelcome or like they had done something wrong. And he said it totally changed her heart. She went out of her way to connect with these boys. Not only that, she would come in half an hour before every service and pray for every chair and everybody's son or daughter or grandkid that was going to be sitting in there and that God would touch their hearts and just began to transform her from the inside out. The culture of the house began to change because she was willing to accept a shift in what God was, was doing in the house and in her heart. And so we need to be the kind of people that are ready for that. We make room for others. We make room for God to move. We, we, we don't just come after God, just do good stuff to me, but God do good stuff through me, right? Do good stuff through me. Um, and boy, is he ever doing good stuff. I want to just share a couple testimonies before we get started today. Um, cause we've had a few, I'm starting to say like, it, like it used to be a couple of weird weeks or, but now it's like getting onto like, we're moving into two months of like just awesome stuff is happening and God's just doing things and we are being changed from the inside out and it's exciting. But also it means that sometimes the services are a little unusual and, and things happen. And, you know, sometimes we're dancing in the 
front, you know, until 1.30 in the afternoon. And sometimes, like last week's Saturday night service, we didn't finish worship until quarter to nine. I literally preached a 15-minute message. It was only half of page one. Um, but that was, that was all they got. So they're a little bit behind what's happening Sunday morning. But God's just doing stuff. But sometimes when those things happen that are a little unusual, we're like, what is actually happening? You know, like last Sunday morning, do you guys remember Mel called out middle of worship? She just started singing about crooked places being made straight and said, I believe that God's healing backs this morning, that there's something God is doing, uh, straightening backs. And, and for most of us, we sit there and go, well, that's awesome. I wonder if that actually happens or not, or if that's just something we add into the service. Well, Rob, who's in sound this morning, was one of the ones that got it last week. And it's incredible. Rob's story is that he'd had an accident a couple of years ago and his back was so crunched up for the last two years he has had chronic pain. And so like to the point where every time he stands up or moves, he braces himself for the pain that comes, you know, when he first steps because that, that pain's there. So when worship was happening, he was kneeling down in worship and he said when he went to stand up, he mentally braced himself for the pain that's going to come when he stands up, only there wasn't any. And his back for the first time in two years is 100% pain-free. Praise God! Isn't that awesome? In worship, the, the night before, we had uh, Jane Reef was, stand, uh, was up in the upstairs. And as worship was happening, I don't know if everybody knows, but she, she's broken her foot and um, has been in a, the boot cast thing and whatever. And basically, they, they wanted to do surgery on it. They were just waiting to see how to proceed with it. And so Jane had uh, gone in for an uh, x-ray. And she had two small, uh, like, like uh, little cracks, like little fractures on one side, and then a really bad one down the other side, and then across the top of her toes. So basically, they were wanting to do surgery and put in pins and everything. Particularly, those two big ones needed to be corrected um, with mechanical help. And so as we're in worship last week, she's sitting there, and all of a sudden, she said she just felt this incredible pain in her foot. And, uh, but she was sitting down, but she said, like to describe it, she felt like her bones were moving inside the cast, the, the bones were moving. So Tuesday, she goes in to get the next x-ray so that they can prepare for surgery or whatever. And she goes in and her doctor pulls up the, the, the x-ray and he's like, oh my goodness, this is so bad. I need to, I'm going to call around and I'm going to try and get you in for surgery as soon as possible. Like this, this needs to be handled. We need to get some pins in there. And Jane sits there and she goes, what's the date on that x-ray? And he, he looks and he's like, oh, I, no, that's not right. And she's like, no, I think that's the old one. That looks like the first x-ray. So he looks, yeah, it is. That's from last week. She's like, where's the x-ray from today? So he goes back in and digs it out, puts it up. The, the two, little, two little cracks that will heal by themselves are still there. The rest is gone. It's not on the x-ray at all. Isn't that amazing? And the doctor just said, I actually can't explain this. And Jane said, I can. I was in church and we were praying and God, and so she just shared the gospel with her doctor. And I'm like, yes, God. So when you're wondering when it gets a little weird and unpredictable, like expect that God is doing something. It's incredible. We've got one man in the house who's been out of work for a little bit here. And he was just praying like, God, I need, like, obviously I need work, but specifically I want to be able to serve in the house. Like, I want to be off on weekends. And so in his trade, that never happens. You, you don't get weekends off. But he was just praying, like, God, I, I, want, I, want, um, I want to be able to serve in the house. And so this past week, he actually got a phone call for a job he hadn't applied for. Um, and God brought in and offered his dream job where they had a rate. It's higher pay than he's experienced before with weekends off. Sign the paper. That is God, people. That is God doing his stuff, right? Isn't that so good? So we had the miracle of the financial provision for some of our students, which is incredible. I've had a couple people contact me this week who have had spontaneous deliverance from emotional uh, issues, uh, depression, spirit of heaviness. They're like, I, I didn't even know that I was dealing with this, but it's gone. It's just gone. I just feel clear. I feel better. Something has changed. That is God. That is the God we serve. How awesome is that, right? So we're picking up this week on our culture statement on who we are as a family. And uh, if you weren't here last week, I really encourage you to catch it online because we're in the middle of just breaking down 
who we are as a church, who we are meant to be. And we have been called in this season to really press into the family, to be a family. We are a family that, yeah, we're, we're not going to be just like the sit around and sing kumbaya kind of people. We're going to be probably a fairly militant family, but we're a family. And God is, is waking up something new that is in us, but it's going to be passionate. It's going to be full of life. I mean, you can't hear stories like that and be like, oh, praise God. I mean, there's an x-ray that shows that something is different than it was last week, completely inexplicably. Like there was, the, you know, the girl that I shared about before who was supposed to be gone. She was supposed to have passed away this summer back in church last week with t-shirts. She brought me a t-shirt that says prayer warriors. I'm like, yes, I will wear that proudly. Like, I mean, she's, she's on, God is doing stuff. We need to be passionate about this, but we also need to be wise in moving forward because when there's, when there's stuff happening and it's, it's new and it's exciting, we have to responsibly steward what God is doing, right? That's the thing that God's calling us to. And so as a, as a move forward, God has called us to focus on being a family. Now, what's going to happen with that is that anointing is going to trickle down into your own home. It's going to trickle down into your own marriage. It's going to trickle down into your own parenting and grandparenting. It's going to be something that changes us personally. But we as a house need to begin to pursue this. And I was studying this, you know, last, last week we began talking about the family thing and, and talking about, you know, where God's taking us and the heart of God. And uh, I was just meditating on how when, when Jesus was leaving the earth. He's on his, his final time of his ministry, of his mission, his assignment here. And he goes into prayer. And John 17 is one of the most interesting passages because it's where Jesus is praying. And we know that Jesus, he only said what he heard the Father say. He only did what he saw the Father doing, right? And so when Jesus is praying, he is praying back to the Father what the Father is instructing him to pray. So there's something that's coming out of the Father. But John 17, we don't have this on the screen because it's an add-on. So you could look it up in your handy-dandy Bibles or your phones if you're going that way. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but it says in verse 20 of John 17, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So not just, I'm not just praying for the disciples that are following me. I'm praying for us. Jesus prayed for us. Is that awesome? Like Jesus prayed for us. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So he's saying here, Father, I'm praying that same way that you interact with me. I'm going to be in them. And when I'm in them and when I'm operating through them, it's going to tie them together. And when they are functioning in that way, the same way that you function in me, which is a father's son, it's a family thing, right? Jesus specifically was operating in a family anointing with the Father. And the same way that you're in me and I'm going to be in them. And when they function in this, there's going to be a oneness of me and them and them together. That when the people see it, they're going to recognize you, the Father. There's this full circle thing that happens where people actually can see the Father through our love for one another. When we pause on that for just a little minute, the idea that when, when, when you see broken people, maybe we are, some of us here this morning, you're utterly broken. This was your last stop today. Like you just don't even, the answer is that God, the Father, loves you so radically and completely that he sent the Son to pay the price to say, no one comes to the Father but by me. But the goal then is to get to the Father through Jesus. And then he says, but I'm going to pray that the people who receive me so that they can connect with you, Father, will love each other in the same way that I love you. So that people who are broken and lost will be able to receive the fact that the Father sees them too, loves them too 
cares for them too, has an answer for them too. He says there's, there, there's this, this tie together with how do people see God in us. And not just in us as individuals, in us as a family. It goes on to say in verse 22, And the glory which you gave me, the glory, the manifest presence that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one just as we are one. Wow. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. That the same way the Father loved Jesus, he loves people. And and people are going to see that when we begin to operate in that same glory that we've been given. What I want you to catch here is that it's not just let's choose to like each other. You know what? Find somebody that you can stand to be beside and actually be with them and try and have a... It's not choosing to connect. It's recognizing this is a God assignment where we receive the love of the Father and we live in the love of the Father and we express the love of the Father and the love of the Father reaches people who desperately need to connect with him and they begin to receive the love of the Father and they connect with other people and the love of the Father comes out of them and it connects with other people and suddenly we open the back curtain because people are actually connecting with God. That's an amazing thing. It's not about willpower. It's about a gift from God. It's an anointing from heaven. I want you to just flip with me as well to John 19, because this one I think is so interesting. I was meditating on how Jesus, when he was on the cross, we know this story. I hope you know this story. You know, it was, it was such an incredibly intense way of death. It was Jesus going through the process to take every single issue that we might face. Not just to cover the sin, but, it, he, you know, he took our shame. He took our, our abandonment. He took the pain. He took, he took everything that we might possibly face. And so what he said and did in that time of the cross was transformative. He was very careful in what he said. Every, every word was measured. There's just a few phrases that Jesus said from the cross because what he experienced was so brutal. He had to actually, the way the crucifixion worked was that people would be like hunched over and hanging on the nails. And to be able to say something, he would have had to push up on the nails. He would have to push up in pain to be able to get enough breath in his lungs to be able to say something. It means that you think ahead of time, what is it I'm going to say? And you measure every syllable. Every word that Jesus spoke from the cross was a measured, precise, deliberate word that he was receiving from God the Father, that he was releasing a prophetic utterance. So we see things like, you know, when he said to the the thief on the cross beside him, and he said, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. Why would he bother to answer that statement? You know, here's a guy who deserved to be crucified. He was a bad guy. Why would Jesus bother to put the effort in to respond to him. The guy on the other side's heckling. But Jesus pushed up and responded and said, this day you'll be with me in paradise, so that we know that no matter how far gone we are, no matter how much we've messed up, no matter how many years we've spent in the toilet, there is a moment where we can come to Jesus and Jesus goes, yeah, today. Today, my grace is sufficient for you. Today, the price is paid. Today, this thing that I have done for you, it's enough. Then it's not about you, it's about me. He said that because it matters. He he said specifically, it is finished. Why? You know, it wasn't a long, drawn out thing because it needed to be a measured statement. He needed to say something that was important. It is finished means like, yeah, but what about this issue? What about, what about anger? What about depression? What about fear? What about torment? Maybe I, I can deal with this one. I can pacify this one. I can, I can package this one. I can manage this one. Jesus just simply said, it is finished, because there's no room for debate there. What is finished? It. All of it. I am he, Jesus said when he, when he was being arrested. I, I am everything. The great I am I, uh, that I am said it is finished. It is all finished. So one of the other things that he says specifically, so you know it's measured, right? Everything that he said mattered. 
But he says uh, in verse 25, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, uh, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, now imagine this, he saw her. Jesus has other biological brothers and sisters, by the way. He has other people in his natural family that, that are there. So, you know, she's not going to be completely alone. But he looks and he sees her. And just imagine, this, uh, this, this suffering has been going on since last night. The beating, the whipping, the crucifixion. He's, he is at the end of this assignment. God say, laid aside his glory, came to the earth as a baby. He lays it, he, he, he gets to this point where it's just about finished. But he takes this moment and he pushes up on his feet, takes that breath, and very specifically, he looks at his mom. And he says, woman, behold your son. He's talking about John who's standing next to her. Then he would have slumped back down again. Would have taken the time, felt the pain, pushed up again, looked at him, looked at John. Then he said to the other disciple, behold your mother. See, there's something that happens there where everything that Jesus released from the cross is this anointing. It's an assignment that comes from heaven. It's an assignment that carries the weight of glory on it. It's something that is not about, you should add this to your to-do list. It's a transformative word that comes from the heart of the Father that Jesus released that's meant to transform us. And when the instructions come, grace comes. Grace is the empowerment to do what it is we've been assigned to do. So he looks at his mom and he says, look at your son. He looks at John and he says, look at your mother. In other words, he's saying, I'm expecting you to receive the anointing I'm pouring out right now to decide to be a family, to decide to love one another, to decide to open your hearts to one another, to decide to move forward together, to decide to not be isolated, to decide to not be alone. I'm choosing to give this anointing to you and I'm asking you to choose to pick it up. It says then, and from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. From that hour, there was an act of obedience where he just decided, I'm going to receive that anointing. I'm going to step into a family anointing. I am going to choose to love like this is my very own mother. I am going to choose. And it wasn't just because it was Jesus's mother. It was that there was an anointing for family that was being released. I want us to understand as we move forward today, and we're talking about culture, and we're talking about a culture of family, and what is the, the culture of this family? It is not about something that we mentally assent to. It's something that we respond to by the heart because there's an anointing for it. We have tried different things before. You know, I remember Pastor Paul, uh, you know, for years would say, I'm going to have gift cards in the office. If people would take new people out for lunch, the church will pay for it. Do you know there was like a couple people that ever took him up on it in years? Why? Because the culture of our community bled into the culture of the church. The culture of our community is a culture of isolation. It's one where people come into this place and you talk to people all the time. And they'll say, I've lived here three or four or five years. I don't really know anybody. I just want to go home. Where's home? Oh, the other side of the world. <laughs> you know, the other side of the nation. Why is that? That's not normal. That's a stronghold over this city that needs to be broken. It's something that is not of God. And when you look at the why behind it, it's because when people are isolated, they're powerless. When people come together, there is something. Remember when they, they were building the Tower of Babel and God said when they come together and they have the same language, nothing's impossible for them. So when the enemy knows that, there is a stronghold of isolation and separation that keeps people hidden behind their own walls and not wanting to tell anybody that they've got something going on or not wanting to, to cry out for help, not wanting to serve anybody else. There's people who live just for vacation after vacation after vacation just to get out of here. That's wrong. 
That's not what God has for this city. God has designed for this city to be a place where his glory dwells. And I'm telling you, in his glory, there's a place for every heart to belong. There is a family that is meant to be representative of the heart of God, the heart of the Father, and we are choosing to pick it up. We as a house are going to have to go against the natural culture to assume the culture that God has called us into in this season. I believe maybe in the past we've tried different things. I, I, there's, there's some people that just, you know, like they have lots of friends in the church. There's other people who have not connected with anybody in years. And we have to move beyond that culture. We have to move beyond that place of isolation. And, and, and it's purposeful. You know, in this house, we've had a radical shift of people. Like it just happens because of the nature of, of the transient jobs in this, in this community. People come and people go. And so what can happen? I mean, I remember, you know, when we had moved to our uh, house in Sexsmith, and I was so excited. I met the new neighbors, and they were great, and really, you know, enjoyed just connecting with them outside. And as soon as we kind of, like, connected, then they moved. So then new people came in, and we connected with them, and then they moved. And by the third time, I'm like, phooey. I'm not, I'm not baking, if we're, if I'm baking cookies, I'm eating the cookies. There's not, <laughs> what's the point? They're just going to leave us, right? They're just going to, because that's what it feels like if you're a long-term person. It feels like other people come and go and they leave us. But if we can recognize that this is not, this is not about choosing just to be nice to people. It's recognizing that there is an anointing for family that on a heart level we have to connect to that is saying yes to God, not yes just to the neighbors. It's yes to God, and I am going to step into that with him. So as we walk through the culture stuff today, we're probably just going to get through a couple more points. Um, my one-week message is rapidly extending. So because change takes a moment right it th this this stuff we have to actually pause on it we have to lay hold of it we can't just go through it by the flesh we have to receive it by the heart the same way that god's asking us to to walk in obedience in every other area of life he's asking us to walk into obedience with one another and, and when you just look around like for instance i'm gonna group participation right now if you have been in this church less than five years would you raise your hands okay I want everybody to look around. Keep the, just keep them up. These are the people that have been here less than five years. That is at least half of us. That means we got some work to do. Okay, you can put them down. Thank you. So let's, in reverse, if you've been here more than five years, raise your hands. Yeah, okay. So about 50-50 split, right? It, that means we cannot, for, for those of us that have been here super long, we cannot afford to just hang on to our own old friends. There has to be some connection with new people. There has to be an openness and a willingness. And, and when, when we see what's happened just right here, what happens as God continues to move? I mean, let me tell you, if I heard a testimony about somebody's foot being miraculously healed and I had an injury or I had an accident, I would totally come to this church. If, if I got a death sentence from the doctor and they said this cancer is untreatable, you're, you're, you're not going to make it, I would totally come to this church. If, if I heard that there was, that there was uh, you know, I was laid off from work and I don't know what I'm going to do and there's no opportunities for me, but I heard the testimony of somebody getting their dream job when they hadn't even, I would totally come to this church. Why? Because I need something that I don't really know what I need, but I have a practical need and we can attach a God answer to it. We need to be prepared for that. We need to be ready to welcome people into this place. And if this is your first Sunday, welcome. I just realized I'm talking to you like you've been here forever, but we are. I mean, the first Sunday, my, some of our very best friends um, are Jason and Janina McFarland. They've moved out of town now. We're still really connected. But when we first met them, the second week we were at the church, we invited them over to our house. We were the new people. And we're like, you know, why don't you come over for the night and we'll have supper and whatever. And then afterwards we thought, what have we done? What if they're weird? <laughs> and some of us think that, right? It's like, I don't know about those people. What if they're weird? Have you met you? Somebody thinks every one of you is weird, right? Some, somebody thinks I'm weird. So what? It was like worst case scenario, we have a weird night. You know, whatever. 
but it opened up conversation that lasted for years and years and years. You never know, but God's calling us into a kind of relationship that's going to ask us to push past our cultural boundaries in this city. This needs to be a hub of his presence, a place where you bump into the heart of the Father with every person you talk to, where you feel loved and accepted. So keeping in mind, culture is a combination of what you create and what you allow. What we are creating right now means that we are purposefully going after the assignment God has given us. What has maybe been, or maybe, you know, as we're going through these culture points, it might be, well, that hasn't been my experience. Okay, maybe we have allowed some other things to drift into the house, but no more. What we are allowing has to change. What we are choosing to do has to change. And none of these things are, oh, Pastor C thinks these are a great idea. These are the highlights that God has given us to say, this is what I want this family to look like. Doesn't matter what the other families look like. It doesn't matter what other churches are doing. We're not going to apologize for, for who we are. We're going to be us. But this is what we're going to experience here. So let's just begin to move through the culture things again. Um, we've got the culture statement at the beginning of this, but essentially it starts with this phrase. Victory Church Grand Prairie is a multi-generational, multicultural family, passionately pursuing God and his purposes on the earth. That means like when we, when we sang this morning and we just, you know, there, there's like some shouts and there's some clapping and there's some whatever. We are passionately going to express our heart to God, right? We are absolutely going to be multi, uh, multi-generational. I was reading an article this morning even. There's um, Carrie Newhoff is, is a Canadian leader of leaders. And he, he's recognizing this crisis in the church because he's getting letters on repeat asking him what's a polite way to ask parents to remove their children from the, the service. And he's like, since when did we ask people to remove children from the service? And he's getting on repeat, like, how do we ask parents to just maybe enjoy the service from the foyer? Wrong question. I mean, on, on, if your kid is having the two-year-old full-on tantrum, maybe, like, just move them aside, like, handle it. But, but in general, a little kid noise, like, just go to a church that's got nothing but people over 70. And they're so happy to hear a kid cry right? There is a sound, there's a buzz of kids that is actually a good thing. And we love kids in this house. We're not going to silence them. We, they are on purpose in here in worship because we want them to grow up experiencing the presence of God. We want them to know it's normal to worship, to raise their hands, to clap, to dance. Yeah. And if it's a little disruptive sometimes, that, that's not actual disruption. It's kids experiencing God for the first time. And Jesus said, be like them. So maybe some of us need to get a little more noisy, you know, like, let's get it out there. But that's who we are. We want to be okay with every age group in this house. I'm, I'm fascinated with how, you know, people have a little bit more life experience. That was a really good way to put it, right? have skills that other, like this generation doesn't even know. There's stuff that, that, that there's been a crossover. There's been a gap in a lot of ways and things that we just don't know. There's stuff that we as a society are medicating and, and, and um, you know, counseling and whatever that the generation before us is like, well, you know what we did? And they've got these simple answers. And it's like, well, that totally works. Why didn't I think of that? We need the generations together. And so God's calling us into this multi-generational family. Multicultural. Multicultural is such a beautiful thing, and it needs to be purposefully pursued. One of the things that I am uh, really moving towards, like I'm really excited, our new, um, we've got our church board. One of our new board members is George Sarkoti. He is somebody, God sent us him. Yes. He's. Him and Tina got sent here from Ghana the long way around. But, man, every time I talk to him, I'm like, that is so wise. Like, that is so wise. God's given him a, a heart to pursue education and study. And he just, he thinks with wisdom. And when, when you know, if I was to say, George, I think we're going to fast and pray for eight days straight, no eating, no nothing, he'd be like, yes, I'll be there. Like, that's, because because he says in his culture, he grew up, his, his mentor would mentor him in prayer and fasting. 
and, and would tell him, like, you're not going to die. Like, let's do this together. And would give him what, I forget what the phrase was, but it was like a, yes, a first aid meal. So basically like straight bread or something. Like, if you think you're going to die, here's a little something to hold you over, but then we're going back to fasting. He was trained in that. So some of us in our culture, because we're very food driven, right? We're like, what do you mean, Lord God? We're going to, what? Like not, what? Why would we not eat, you know? Or you like, you go, if you're, if you're going for blood tests or whatever at the little clinic and there's that morning, people are there as soon as it opens because I had to fast since last night, 10 o'clock. Do you normally eat in the middle of the night? Like that's, right? I don't even know. Or like I've gone to Filipino birthday parties and stuff around here. I had no idea you could fit that many people in a house. Like it's just like there's there's still room. Keep shoving and everybody brings food and there's like food to feed the entire neighborhood. But it's a party because somebody's having a birthday. We're like, I don't have seating for that many people. Like some, somebody might have to sit on the floor. Like seriously. Bring us that culture. Teach us how to family. Teach us how to celebrate. Teach us how to do this. Multicultural is a beautiful thing. So this is who we are, and we're going to continue pursuing this. Some of the Mennonite culture in the house, oh, food. Enough said. <laughs> when I find out that we've got a few Mennonite families coming to a potluck dinner, I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'll bring the Rice Krispie Square. <laughs> it's so good. So this is who we are, and this is the beginning of our culture. We are passionately pursuing God and his purposes on the earth. How many of you have got started on the, uh, the Way of Life book? Is it transforming you already? Yes. So, so, so good. So I, I again want to put in a plug for Tuesday nights. Man, this study is going to be off the hook. But seriously, it is about going after the heart of God and his purposes on the earth. What is his purpose? And do you know how refreshing it is to get out of your own head and your purposes? My purposes are lame. My purposes way underachieve what his purposes are. My purposes are very self-indulgent, feely, you know, what, what's comfortable for me. His purposes rock the earth. Like, how great is that? So that's what we're after. And in this family, then moving forward, last week we touched on this one. In this family, we put God first, period. That is our number one culture statement. These aren't in any specific particular order. But in this family, we put God first. We follow his leading in all things. We're not going to apologize for that. In gatherings, in relationships, in finances, in vision, he is always first. It means if he wants to take over, like honestly, I was talking to um, Aisha last night, and she said, you know, I'm totally comfortable. Like, if you, if you feel like you need to preach till 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we'll be here. Like, I'm good for it. I'm like, well, he, has, like, he hasn't told me yet. But seriously, who told us that we need a timeline on stuff? Like, when you're watching, when you're watching, like, the playoffs in hockey or football, when it goes into overtime, aren't you like, yes! Like, this, this is the good stuff. This is when you bring out the special snacks, right? This is, this is the good snacks. It's the good drinks. Let's get in there, right? This is sometimes if God wants to go into overtime, that's the good stuff. That's the good. Well, who told us we need to be like, well, tickety boo, this is, we need to just really, oh, we got to get out. We just, honestly, God will cover it. Like if you're, if we're going a little long and your kids are honestly just ravenous, like check with one of our office team. We got snacks in the kitchen, but let's just do this thing. Like we're okay if somebody orders pizza, right? Go out, have a slice, come back in. Let's just sit here. Let's, let's pursue him. Let's do what we need to do. But he gets preeminence. It means if there's prophetic words, if God wants to speak in some way, if there's, you know, I don't know, I don't know the words to the songs. Melody just went into some weird place and it was just, I don't know. Then just listen and receive. Because if God wants to talk, it's the best words you're going to hear all week. Right? Those prophetic things are worth it. Sometimes, and not everybody picks up, but sometimes uh, we've got prophetic musicians on the stage for sure. Sometimes when Mike or Wayne goes into an electric guitar thing, and some of us are like, I don't know about guitar in the church. In this house, yes, it's happening. But, man, there's a scripture 
There, I mean, there's several of them, but there's specific scriptures that talk about the instruments prophesying. That where, where um, Elisha had to come and give a word from God, and he's like, I can't even say anything. Somebody bring me a musician. He needed that anointing to release a prophetic sound into the atmosphere so that he could even catch the heart of God to be able to speak it forth. If we go into a drum solo, we go into a guitar thing, just realize it's not performance. It's, no, God is moving in a new way. Lean into it. Like, feel it, right? Do that thing. It's, these are not things that are popular in the people-seeking culture. But in the God-seeking culture, anything's possible. So we love this. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. I believe if we go after this and we say this is who we are, what kind of church are you? Well, it's unpredictable, but we always put God first. So, you know, maybe most times it's fairly similar, but sometimes it just, God just does stuff. That's going to be our normal. If people are not okay with that, then they'll just go to a different church. And that's 100% fine. But you'll find that people who are like, I need to hear the voice of God. They can't wait to get here, right? They can't wait to come and let's see if something happens. To, what, what's going to, and God will respond to that level of hunger, right? That level of pursuit, that level of giving him preeminence, the anointing can flow into that. This family can flow with that. So now we go into number two, and this one is actually, talked about it a little bit already, but this one makes us pay attention. Number two, in this family, we show hospitality. We show hospitality. And right now you're like, oh, my house isn't clean enough. I don't think I'm up for this. I don't know if I want this to be part of my culture, blah, blah, blah. This is a big deal. This is a really big deal because hospitality in its literal definition is open-hearted welcome open-hearted welcome. It helps if there are cookies, but it's really not, it turns out, in the actual translation. We welcome everyone and we love well. We love because he first loved us. Let's just leave that out for a minute. We welcome everyone. And I've mentioned this before from the pulpit, but I have had people ask. We have, we've gotten emails from people. We've had people contact the office. You know, I'm gay. I'm this. I'm in a this kind of a relationship, would I be welcome in your church? Yes. The answer is yes. We welcome people into this house because people are people. And if anybody doesn't have an issue going on in their lives right now, I would be surprised. Every one of us has something God is working out in us and through us. Every one of us, there's layers of refinement that he does. But we love well. Loving well, you know it when your kids kind of go off the rails a little bit. You love them completely. You don't love everything they do. You don't have to get behind everything they do, but you love them well. You, you, know, you let them know they've always got a place to go. They've always got somebody to talk to. They've always got somebody that will pray for them, that will serve them, that will minister to them. They've always got a place to go. Does not mean that you agree with everything. And so we've got to separate that. Our culture demands us to make a stance. Our, so this is where we choose our culture, right? We don't allow the culture to bleed in. The culture that would try to bleed in is the one that is generated by the demonic in the first place. It's that thing that labels churches, it labels Christians, it labels people into, well, you have to, you have to make a statement. You have to make a stand. You have to, whatever. And, and, and really, Jesus, like when Jesus connected with people, he loved people. He just loved people. He never just condoned things that were off in any way. But he, he loved people completely, ministered into their heart and life, and then change came. So whatever's going on in our lives, there's like that's just the thing that's on the radar of everybody right now. But there's all kinds of issues that all of us face. And we have to just say, who's, what kind of person is welcome in this house? Anybody. You know, we've had Sikhs in here, we've had Muslims, we've had, we've had people from all the, are they welcome? Absolutely. We will welcome them. We will make space for people and we will love well because he first loved us. And so looking at this, John 1, or sorry, 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us and therefore we begin to love who he loves. 
That's where that comes. We love because he first loved us. Now, this is where we're talking about. This is actually an anointing that we put a draw on. We don't love because we choose to love. We love because we're choosing to do the right thing. We love because we're choosing to what we love because he first loved us. We step into that anointing. Father, I thank you for what you've given me. I thank you that Jesus, out of love, you paid the price for me. I receive that love. Wow, and out of the overflow of that love, I cannot wait to love somebody else. It's just overflowing in me. I can't wait to find somebody to just go love. I'm tapping into the anointing for family. I'm tapping into something that's not of my own making. It's not something that I self-generate. It is about you. And at the more I love you and I'm loved by you, the more I just love everybody. The more I see people through your eyes, the more I have a perspective that's completely different. There's this thing that can, can shift. We can move, you know, our homeless population, for instance. It can be something we can get super bitter about and we can be like, why isn't somebody doing something? Or we can put a draw on the love of the Father. God, tell me how you see me. Tell me how you see my life. God, I, I, I want to feel your love. Father, I want to feel your love. And you engage him in that place of love. And out of that, and then you begin to say, okay, God, show me. Show me what you see when you look at these people. Show me what you see when you see this situation. And love begins to rise up. And you have people like the ones that, that came and asked, could we go and feed people in Tent City? Out of why? Out of just because I have nothing to do on a Friday night? No, because love overflowed and love said, it, love can give a sandwich, love can give a hot dog, love can meet a need. Love, uh, there's never ending supply of love as long as I'm doing this out of the anointing. There is no shortage. I can love endlessly because I never run out of his love. This is the kind of church we need to be. Now, 1 Peter 4, 8-9 says above all things that's an interesting phrase above all things have fervent love for one another now this is talking about the family for love will cover a multitude of sins be hospitable to one another without grumbling so suck it up that's, that's like right that's that's apostle speak for suck it up. Be, love one another with the love that you've been given. None of us are all that lovable. Did you know that? Like even though we think, oh, yeah, who wouldn't love me? Yeah, no, really. Um, every, everybody's got their stuff. Love, that perfect love that we receive, we begin to operate in that and we love one another in that same way. Fervent love, specifically fervent love. This is an intense kind of love that God's calling us to. It's love that leads to hospitality or an open-hearted welcome, right? Fervent love for one another will cover a multitude of sins. Oh, but that person has issues with this. Oh, that person is just difficult to be with. That person just nags. That person just complains. That person just whatever. You know what the answer is? Fervent love, passionate love. It's not avoidance. Oh man, I can't stand to be around that person. It's I put a draw on the Father's love and I begin to pour out the Father's love. God, show me what you see in this person. God, help me love them well. Help me have an open-hearted response to them and be hospi uh, hospitable to one another without grumbling. If we were to go on to verse 10, it's not on the screen, but it says, as each one has received a gift minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As each one has received a gift. I don't think I can do this. I don't have any more energy. I have no room for anybody else in my life. I'm barely coping myself. My two-year-old is sucking the life out of me. I can't do this. You know, if you knew what my life was like, you would not be asking me to do this. Okay. But the same, out of the same gift, what, what you have received, minister that to one another. It, this is an invitation. God is saying, can you, can you come? Because number one, he is first, right? When you come in on a Sunday morning and God touches your heart and he begins to minister his love to you and he begins to stir us on the inside, he, he lets you know that he sees you, he cares for you, he cares for the details of your life, he cares about the big stuff, the small stuff, he sees you. When you begin to receive that, this is telling us that by faith, 
we can recognize that as an impartation that has come. And now we have something to draw from to give out. It means that Monday should be our most productive day of loving people. It means if you come in here in the house and God just pours out his love, I can't wait to just go and bless somebody else. I want to love people. It means that after service here, when we've had this incredible time of worship and God's been speaking, we should be able to look at each other with those love eyes. You're awesome. You're a great person. I just love you. God's given me such a love for you. I've got one um, pastor friend who, who, you know, at the end of every one of his texts or messages, he's like, you know, you're in my heart. And the first couple times I read, I'm like, that is weird. And then I heard his story, right? Because that's a, hmm. but I, I heard his story and he, he said that he, years ago, he's got the exact date because he said it was a life-changing moment in his ministry where he had had a, uh, he was pastoring and he had a pastor come over from India who was having just incredible church growth. Like the church was just exploding. They had, I forget what it was, something like 120 churches that had been planted out of it. And it was just like exploding thousands and thousands of people. So he had this guy come over to share, you know, on church growth and development and like, what, what are you doing that's working? And he said he was there for a couple of days and, and this pastor's like carrying around a notebook at all times because I'm just going to suck all the wisdom out of him and like make it my own and whatever. And he said for like three days, he said nothing great. Like nothing, nothing profound at all. So finally, the last day, he was like, I need to actually like poke into this. If I'm going to get anything out of this. I need to poke into this a little bit. So he just asked him like, what, why are your churches growing? Like what's, what's going on? Like specifically what's going on in your, in your uh, neighborhood and your part of the world? He pulls out a map out of his pocket and he lays it out and he's like, here are our churches and here are my leaders and this is what God is doing and here's where we're headed. And he's like, okay, if you got that many leaders though and you know exactly where they are, like what do you, like how do you raise them up? What are you, what are you doing with the leaders that's making a difference? Because we're not having that kind of results at all. And he said, well, I impart to the leaders. And this pastor said, um, like I've read that in every leadership book ever. Like, you impart to your leaders. Yes, of course, you focus on your leaders. Your leaders will focus on the people, whatever. So then he realized there's got to be more to it than this. Maybe it's a language thing, but that, there's got to be more to it than that. So he said to him, what do you mean you impart to your leaders? He said, I love them like my own children. I open my heart to them. And he said in that moment, that just like arrested him because he was like, I don't do that. I have a space that's reserved for my natural family, but I don't love anybody else like that. And, and he said the very next Sunday, he was in church and he felt like God say, um, uh, there, was a, there was a young man across the room and he felt God say, are you ready to try this? Oh, what? Are you ready to love like you would love your own son? Now, it didn't mean like, come home with me. I've got a room for you, free room and board. It wasn't like that kind of thing. But it's in this moment. See, hospitality is open-hearted welcome. So he said he looked at his, this guy, didn't know him, went over to him, and he just, he thought, if this was my son, I would go over and just give him a huge hug. And it wouldn't be like the, hey, nice to meet you, whatever. It would be, it would be a father-son hug. So he said he goes over and he begins to hug this kid, and it was like an extended hug, which if it's not an anointed thing, that's weird, by the way. <laughs> just a caution there. I don't want everybody to follow this verbatim. But so he goes over and just gives him this extended hug. And all of a sudden, this young guy just starts sobbing. And his heart just opens up. And he begins to just receive the love. And so this pastor just begins to pray the father's love over him. And he says, do you know, do you know the father loves you so much? God sees you today. He knows what you came in here with. He just began to speak and minister love over him. And this kid's countenance just completely changed. And he received love. But how was it deposited? See, it's the same thing as when Jesus said, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He was asking for an open-hearted response that will put a draw on the anointing and release the heart of the Father into the earth. It's the same thing when Jesus prayed that the, 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 the same thing that we have, Father, as you are in me and I am in them, let them be made perfect in one. And the grace which you have given me, I give to them. And when people see it, they'll know that you have sent me. They'll believe in you. They'll experience. They'll know that you have loved them. Because this anointing begins to flow. 
this radical heart of the Father begins to flow. This requires both giving and receiving. It's one thing to give, but if we on the receiving end are like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Jesus didn't just say, mother, see your son. Because that would have been obvious. You know, if, I mean, I would have assumed that if I was John standing there, be like, oh, he means that I'm supposed to take care of his mom. He specifically spoke into giving and receiving. He specifically said, you need to open your heart on both sides of this thing. And we need to create a culture in this house that is open hospitality. It's a place where now when that pastor sends me a text and he says, you're in my heart, it means, you know what? He's decided to love me with the Father's love. And so therefore I can trust him. And when he asks me how I'm doing, I actually tell him. There's other, other leaders and other pastors that say, how are you doing today? And I'm like, I'm good. Because I know they don't necessarily have that same kind of love for me but when this pastor contacts me I know that he means it and if I say not good at all things are falling apart I'm a wreck today he's gonna drop everything to minister into that place I know that I, I have not ever moved into their home I have not decided to you know like it's gonna but I I know that I have somewhere I can go do you understand what I'm saying this is next level for us to family together it's an anointing to be open with one another. And yes, sometimes it is practical things. In fact, a lot of times there's a difference. We have been spoken of in this house and, and just this is the reality of culture, right? What we create and what we allow. We have been told many, 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 many times that we're a super friendly church, but we're not very welcoming. Friendly means we shake your hands, we get your name. Welcoming means we shake your hands, we get your name, we invite you for coffee. We actually go the next step. When we meet you next week, we don't have to get your name again because we remember it. We actually care about some of the stuff that's going on. Um, you know, it's, it's taking people for lunch. It's inviting them into your home. It's the practical stuff. I got, you know, somebody, if you saw on Facebook, we got somebody in the house that's so great at just practical hospitality. She makes, you know, all sorts of treats. Um, Doreen Cram, she's amazing. How many of you have received something from Doreen? Doreen, if you're watching online, she's out on the East Coast. Doreen brought me homemade cookies for my dog, which were, I know, they were gift wrapped in everything. So, I, like, and I'm blessed because, like, not everybody understands the dog thing. And so, you know, I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. And I get them home, and they're in the fridge, so I'm assuming they're meat or something, right? But I, I open it up, so I, I do the thing, like, because I want to know what's, well, they're peanut butter. So I don't know what else is in them, but they're peanut butter and I give it to the dog and he like does what he always does, which is like inhale the whole thing at once. But then he like spits it back out on the floor and then nibbles on it. And he's just like totally enjoying it. And you can see he's, it's like, oh, it's a chewy peanut butter cookie. So Wayne comes home from work. He's like, he's like what are those? Oh, Doreen made chewy peanut butter cookies for the dog. <laughs> You can tell there's not a lot of baking that happens at our house because he's like, well, I like peanut butter cookies. <laughs> I think there was actually a moment of consideration about like... <laughs> <laughs> but you know what it said to me? Like she could have, like whatever, right? What it said to me was, Pastor, I'm thinking about you today. I'm praying for you today. And I care about what you care about. So here's some dog treats, right? So if anybody wants to pity Wayne and bring in peanut butter cookies, please do. <laughs> but it, it sends a message that's not about the cookies, right? The cookies are the catalyst for the message. Family lives love together it's that thing uh one of one of our ladies just you know she she was um having a hard time getting her lawnmower started this week somebody came over started her lawnmower she was grateful for it it changed her day changed her weekend she responded by making him um an apple crisp or something like that like a fruit crisp he was super excited because he got baking and to me that's just family that's open-hearted welcome that god's calling us into what i want us to understand today though this is going to be the message that never ends, apparently. That was just one culture point. Um, we can choose to do this, but so can every social group in the city. Or we can step into the anointing for it 
And we can give out of what God gives us, and it actually is life-changing. It actually is sustainable. It's not about whether people reject us. We can't, you know, the thing that holds us back is like, I don't know how to do this right. Uh, what if people reject me? What if this goes badly? What if people just use me? Jesus said, you can't take my life, I give it. Right? When we're putting a draw on the anointing and we're loving and serving out of an anointing, there's no end to this. It's not about how people respond then. It's about how we are responding to the Father and putting ourselves in a position to be able to release the Father's love. So I'm going to have Pastor Jason just come as we close today. I know your kids are done pretty quick here, but he's had an interesting experience with this. Um, a lot of people have, you know, have pushed back a little bit. Just, I don't mean that in a bad way, but just like I'm struggling with this because maybe you're saying these things because you like your family. You know, maybe, maybe Pastor C, you think this is a big deal because you, you come from a healthy home or whatever. And that is true. I don't have some of the same baggage as other people, but I do know that even a healthy home can cause a bit of a blockage because we can be happy to stay within our happy home, right? This is not the same thing as just people who are alone need to find each other. This is about actually saying God has given us an assignment He's asking us to pursue a culture that matches up with the destiny that he says belongs to us. And the culture will be manifested in what we actually value and put the effort in, and it will be sustained by him. It has to be an anointing. So Pastor Jay is just going to share a couple minutes on that. Feels good to be up here again. Yeah. Thank you. Hold the smoke. All right just switching from children understanding to adults. <laughs> so I just taught some kids some stuff downstairs today. Okay, so yeah. what, are, what this is, the, what we are stepping into, I mentioned this last night, what we're stepping into is something that is so different, that is so unique, it's something that I've never been a part of, ever. I've been in the church for 19 years, um, 20 years in a couple weeks, but, I have never had a healthy family experience. My mom and dad split up when I, before I could even remember. I ran away from home when I was 15, 16 years old. Never went back. All of it. So everything that Pastor Charlotte was talking about is completely foreign to me. Until. Until I realized when I was carrying some baby things down from upstairs when, when Megan and, and Juliana and everybody were having their mom life, mom group that happened last week. I was carrying, I was carrying down the high chair and something else. And I'm like, I don't even know. I don't even know how to do family. What's it like? I don't, I don't even get it. Right. And I mentioned this when we were having the volunteer thing, when we made lunch for the volunteers who helped out this summer, I asked, I said, Pastor Charlotte, where do I go? Where do I serve? I don't know where to go. I, I've never done family. I don't understand. And then she kind of helped me. It's like, this is whatever. But, okay, I'm still in kid mode a little bit, a little jerky, but that's fine. But I'm like, as I'm carrying that chair down the stairs, I have a revelation. I have a revelation of, I don't know how to do family, but I know how to draw on the anointing. I know how to draw on the anointing. I know how to put a draw on God. Last night I said I could suck the anointing out of a bowl of Cheerios. I know how to draw on God because when you serve in the house, like children's ministry, whatever, there's, there's an empowerment to do that, right? I know how to do that. And everything just clicked. It doesn't matter. I'm going to come down here now. It doesn't matter that I ran away from home. It doesn't matter that I have no idea how to do family. All that matters is that I know how to draw on something that I have no experience of. And I can do it now. I did it with all my heart on the Thursday morning with Gloria and the Wit Ladies Bible Study. I did it. And I just wanted to make her thing excellent. I wanted to make Megan's thing excellent. That's what it is. You can't do it in your own strength at all. I could not work up family. Even like I've, Kyra and I, my wife Kyra, she's in the nursery doing stuff right now. Her and I have been married for 15 years. 
And even in that, I've been living that life separated from that family that I married into. I love seeing them. They are amazing. They're incredible. I want my girls who are also serving in children's ministry right now. I want them to understand that family is important, but I didn't know how to do it. All that I could see was that is what I want. That is what I wanted. That's what I want for my kids because I separated myself by choice and I never had it. But I know how to draw the anointing and it changed everything for me. I like the people. I like people that I, I don't even know you and I love you already because you're in the house. You're in the house and God is he's giving you an opportunity to receive something that this church, the church, this church has never had before. Been, I can say that because I've been here for 19 years. It's never had this before. And we're stepping into it. And it's going to change everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. So good. Isn't that good? Yeah. See, that's a game changer, really, is us stepping into a next level of connecting with one another as a result of connecting with God. So we're just going to, I actually feel like Pastor Jason just needs to pray into that an impartation of that same thing that he has received and stepped into so just as we as we cl close the service this morning if you this morning you're like hearing this and it's like i need i need a next level release of that family anointing i need to put a draw on this maybe you're even naturally hospitable but that open-hearted welcome that place of being able to make space for others and and whatever maybe it's been dormant maybe you've been hurt in the past Maybe you felt like you've put yourself out there and it hasn't been given back and it, it and it just caused you to shut down. Maybe you don't understand it at all. Maybe you're comfortable with the circle that you're in right now and it, this, is, this is a challenge. If you feel like you need an impartation of that anointing to love bigger, to create an open-hearted space that will make room for people, that will have that open-hearted welcome that people know they can connect with you, if you've been isolated in any way and you, you have, you've been unwilling to let people connect with you, you're fine all the time. Fine, fine, fine. And you need to just step into that open-hearted welcome. I want you to stand this morning and we're just going to agree together for an impartation of the Father's love today.